Tonight, invoking the Emergencies Act was justified according to a public inquiry, and it was earlier failures that made it necessary. The response to the Freedom Convoy included a series of policing failures. What went wrong, who's to blame, and why the report calls out the Prime Minister for his choice of words. I wish I had phrased it differently. A deadly outbreak in Africa prompts a warning from health officials. A raging fire could be launching embers to other parts of the planet. Why development of a Canadian vaccine was shelved years ago. Your car may be defenseless against thieves. You can literally steal a car in, in less than 60 seconds. A push to make vehicle manufacturers take action. This is The National with Anita Bath. Reaction is rolling in tonight to the final report out of the Emergencies Act inquiry. It says the federal government did meet the threshold for invoking the act last year as anti-vaccine mandate protests took hold, but its substance runs much deeper than that. More than 2,000 pages of it details a series of failures and missteps that allowed the protests to turn into a national emergency in the first place. It also lays out dozens of recommendations for the future. Now, remember, invoking this act had never been done before, and the law required a public inquiry be called into its use. Rafi Bujikanian takes us through the findings released today and the many lessons learned. A year after the Emergencies Act was used to clear anti-vaccine mandate protesters from downtown Ottawa, Commissioner Paul Rouleau delivered his verdict on whether it was justified. The very high threshold required for the invocation of the act was met. Cabinet had reasonable grounds to believe that there existed a national emergency arising from threats to the security of Canada. But Rouleau said he didn't reach that conclusion easily and acknowledged reasonable people could come to another one. <laughs> The act gave police the power to compel tow trucks to move big rigs and freeze some protesters' bank accounts. In his report, Rouleau criticized how the whole protest was handled. The response to the Freedom Convoy included a series of policing failures. He chided Ottawa police for a lack of proper planning, no proper assessment of intelligence, fighting among themselves and other forces, and blamed Ontario's government for its lack of engagement in the crisis. The province says it did act, having earlier declared a provincial emergency. It also froze protester funds. Rouleau also took aim at the Prime Minister's decision to call some protesters a fringe minority, saying it likely inflamed the situation. I wish I had said that differently. The fact is, there is a very small number of people in this country who deliberately spread misinformation and disinformation. He also defended his government's decision to use the act. We got into a place where there was no other choice to keep Canadians safe, we felt, than to do this. But Conservative leader Pierre Poilievre says this was an emergency the Prime Minister created. I condemn anyone who behaves badly, breaks laws, or blockades critical infrastructure while standing on the side of the hardworking people who have suffered so much under eight years of Justin Trudeau and were desperately trying to have their voices heard against an insulting and divisive Prime Minister. Rouleau's report includes 56 recommendations, some about intelligence sharing and how police respond to protests. The lawyer representing downtown residents and businesses says he hopes police forces have learned a lesson. I don't think we've really gotten a, a good apology from the Ottawa police to the people of Ottawa. Um, you know, I don't think they ever really owned their mistakes. And Rafi, some of Rouleau's recommendations are about the Emergencies Act itself. Yeah, for a more modern definition of a public order emergency and less ambivalence on what is a threat to national security. Rouleau goes on to say that he wants a future invocation of the act to force the federal government to turn over any documents leading to that decision to a future commission. Now, none of these recommendations are enforceable, but today the prime minister said he commits to have a plan to tackle them within six months, Anita.
Rafi, thank you. You're welcome. The opposition is accusing the prime minister of covering up China's interference in Canadian elections. According to the Globe and Mail, citing secret intelligence reports, Beijing boosted liberal candidates in 2021. Ashley Burke has the fallout and Justin Trudeau's response. Justin Trudeau! It was exactly the result Beijing wanted. You are sending us back to work. At least according to a Globe and Mail report. It cited top secret CSIS documents detailing Beijing's sophisticated strategy to influence the 2021 election. According to the report, China targeted specific conservative candidates in hopes of a liberal minority government. Justin Trudeau knew about this interference. The opposition accuses the prime minister of covering it up. He is perfectly happy to let a foreign authoritarian government interfere in our elections as long as they're helping him. Trudeau said he's never hidden China's attempts to interfere. We have, like I said, known for a long time uh, that China uh, and others uh, engage in foreign interference in Canada, including during our elections. Trudeau said that a panel monitoring the threat concluded it wouldn't have impacted election results. But after reading about the tactics detailed in the Globe story, this expert isn't convinced. They're clearly doing it through human networks that are, are, are burrowing themselves into places of influence. And this is very concerning. This is, uh, I don't, we've never seen anything like this. The Global Mail reported China used its diplomats and their proxies to push Canadians into voting against the Conservatives. They want to really hammer home con comparisons with Trump and that if the Conservatives got elected, they would restrict university uh, students from coming from China, which would hurt these people's uh, families' uh, fortunes. According to the Global Mail, China's then Consul General in Vancouver boasted of being responsible for two Conservative losses there, including former MP Kenny Chu. Chu had introduced a private member's bill to create a registry aimed at cracking down on foreign interference and told CBC last year his loss could encourage China to interfere again. It's like tasting the first political drop of blood and they realize that they have an influence now. This is the second significant intelligence leak since the fall. National security experts say that is unprecedented. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Let's bring in chief political correspondent Rosemary Barton to talk about both of these stories. Rosie, let's start with the Emergencies Act inquiry report. That seems like good news for the Liberals. Yeah, Anita, I mean, it's definitely a political win for the government on a move that was pretty risky at the time. Uh, but it also says Ottawa and other governments could have done things better. There could have been, for, for instance, better consultation with the provinces uh, by the federal government. The province of Ontario itself should have come to the table sooner. So political collaboration was definitely lacking. Reacting to all of this, the Prime Minister today talked about responsible leadership and protecting Canada's institutions and democracy. This report becomes part of how he explains those things to Canadians. Pierre Poiliev, who did support the law-abiding part of this uh, convoy, these protesters, really focused his comments today on the Prime Minister's language during the convoy, as you heard there, and why he says it was ultimately divisive for Canadians. So you can see, I think, how the politics around this issue are going to continue to take shape. For sure. And both leaders also addressed those reports about Chinese interference in the democratic process. Yeah, this is a much more vulnerable issue here for the government, Anita, where the Conservatives have some pretty clear lines of attack and the Liberals have not always communicated clearly on what they know about this issue and they are the current government, so they may be perhaps limited with what they can say for intelligence reasons. Thanks, Rosie, and we'll see you a little later when you're back with a special at issue to talk about both these issues coming out of Ottawa. You bet. A federal government has released its sustainable jobs plan, one that had previously been billed as giving oil and gas workers a just transition to greener jobs. But while the plan is still light on details, Julia Wong is showing us it's a rich target for critics. The official opposition wasted no time blasting the federal government's sustainable jobs plan. Vladimir Putin is smiling today because as Justin Trudeau drives energy jobs out of Canada, he drives money into the hands of foreign polluting dictatorships. The goal of the plan is to save jobs while preparing for a future with less demand for oil and gas and more demand for offshore wind power, solar energy,
and critical minerals. The plan will create a central office to support workers and employers in transitioning industries, fund training programs for workers, and consult with industry, experts, indigenous partners, and provincial and territorial governments. That's a very strong start. Environmental Defense Canada estimates the plan will need at least $15 billion every year. This is really an investment in the future. It's going to lead to economic growth in key sectors, um, and it's going to lead to more resilient um, local economies if done well. At least they did a find and replace on the words just transition. The Alberta Premier has attacked the idea of a federal plan to move away from oil and gas and now suggests she won't support the plan as is. I feel like the federal government, we've got their attention, they know we're angry, they know we're going to push back against them and we will not allow this indi industry to shut down, but they've come nowhere near to meeting us halfway yet. It's still a pretty high level plan. This climate policy expert says denying a coming shift could leave workers and communities worse off. I think it's very clear that we are in a world that is undergoing an energy transition, right? And it's not really a choice at this point. The sustainable jobs plan is just that, a plan. The focus now to get provinces and territories behind it. Legislation is expected to be introduced before the summer. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. The man who crashed a bus into a Laval daycare will undergo a psychiatric evaluation to decide if he's fit to stand trial. Pierre Nice saint amand is facing multiple charges, including two counts of second-degree murder. Those charges stem from this crash last week, which left two kids dead and six more injured. The accused is set to make another court appearance next week after the evaluation. Five former police officers have pleaded not guilty to the killing of Tyree Nichols. He's the man who died after a violent arrest in Memphis that was caught on camera. Nichols' mom was at the courtroom today and spoke shortly after the hearing. I know my son is gone. I know I'll never see him again. But we have to start this process of justice right now. The accused are each facing multiple charges, including second-degree murder. Nichols died in hospital three days after he was beaten by the officers. The video of the 29-year-old's arrest led to a new wave of protests across the U.S. While well, staying in the U.S., where Fox News is facing heat tonight, new court documents show Fox knew Donald Trump's 2020 election fraud claims were completely bogus, but promoted them anyway. From top hosts right up to Rupert Murdoch himself, Paul Hunter walks us through it. The Fox News decision desk can now project that former Vice President Joe Biden will win. Back in 2020, when the votes were finally counted, Fox News itself called it for Joe Biden, albeit with a caveat. Keep in mind the Trump campaign is in the midst of waging legal challenges. None of those challenges ever stuck because there was never any evidence Donald Trump's claims of fraud were true including that vote tabulators by Dominion Voting Systems, a company founded in Canada, were somehow rigged, even linked with corruption in Venezuela. All of it in various ways amplified by Fox News as Dominion labeled it all lies, eventually sitting down with 60 Minutes. I can cut all of this short. Uh, we, we were founded in Toronto, which is where my family was from, and, and there was nothing to do with Venezuela. Can you flip votes in the computer system? Can you add votes that did not exist? <laughs> Absolutely not. Now, in court documents, part of a massive lawsuit against Fox News, Dominion says it has overwhelming direct evidence Fox News knew the election and Dominion's machines were fully legitimate the whole time. It quotes multiple hosts and executives behind the scenes. One calls a Trump lawyer a complete nut. Another says the lawyer is lying, and another says I did not believe it for one second. But Fox ratings had taken a dive, says Dominion, and so to keep the audience happy, it aired falsehoods. As this podcaster bluntly puts it. It's, it's a terrible practice. It's really almost a case study in how not to run a news organization. In response, Fox News says it was simply reporting claims of then-President Trump. The quotes, it says, are out of context, and the lawsuit threatens freedom of the press. It all goes to trial in two months. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington.
John Tory has wrapped his last official day as Toronto mayor just days after news of a secret affair prompted his resignation. And it's why it breaks my heart to leave. But leaving was the right thing to do, as hard as it might be. Tory says he hopes to be remembered for getting transit built and keeping taxes affordable, but he is acknowledging his legacy will likely be tainted by his affair with a younger staffer during the pandemic. In B.C., two people have died after being fully buried under snow. That brings the total number of avalanche deaths in the province this year to nine. Lindsay Duncombe is looking at the cause. Conditions in B.C.'s backcountry haven't been this dangerous in two decades. The latest deadly avalanche happened near this slope, known as Terminator 2.5, just out of bounds of Kicking Horse Resort. Two people died, buried in a wall of snow as wide as a football field. If you're caught in a really big one, I mean, it's going to feel like you're like in a washing machine. You know, it's going to be like you lose like... Uh, you lose perception of like where is up and down. Michel Beauchemin survived avalanches before. He knows that backcountry well. This year in particular, I have been avoiding this exact area where the incident happened. Um, we're talking about like really big uh, avalanche paths, like very steep terrain. The avalanche happened here near the Alberta border. So far, there have been five fatal slides on B.C. mountains this year. Nine people killed. Just last weekend, two skiers died here on Potato Peak. Here's why it's so dangerous. Back in the late fall, it was very cold and snowfall was light, creating a layer of sugary, loose snow. When heavy snow piles on top, the whole snowpack becomes unstable. We're seeing incident after incident released on these deep lower layers. They're very hard for people to properly assess. Um, and when we do get avalanches, they're extremely large. These kind of conditions won't go away until the spring melt. As tempting as those steep slopes may be, even experienced people in the backcountry are warned to be especially careful and consider staying in bounds. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. A new robotic technology has been deployed to see inside a major Antarctic glacier. To learn more about how fast it's melting and what that means, Jayla Bernstein shows us what it found. From the depths of an Antarctic glacier to the halls of the UN, a warning. Ice melt caused by climate change is a threat. Countries like Bangladesh, China, India and the Netherlands are all at risk. Canada, as a northern hemisphere nation, actually receives a disproportional amount of its sea level rise from Antarctica. That's why this international team braved storms and harsh conditions, all to better understand how warming waters impact the vast Thwaites Glacier. This researcher piloted an underwater robot, sending it down a hole in the ice to get a close-up view of the glacier's underbelly. The robot traveled to what's called the grounding line, where the ocean, the ice, and the seafloor meet. The glacier here has retreated 14 kilometers since the 1990s. No one has ever explored this before. And so what we discovered under this ice is that there's lots of like staircase features. Um, they look kind of like long amphitheaters. You can see these little terraces forming, and you can see this little scalloped face of the ice that's all full of sediment, and there's particles just raining out of one particular spot. The data they gathered will help scientists better predict how warming waters will impact future water levels. Do we need a five-foot seawall or a 10-foot seawall, or do we need to move people out of coastal environments in places that are particularly susceptible, right? What else can we do as humans to make our planet livable for us? This thawing glacier already contributes about 4% of the global sea level rise. Research suggests even a small increase in the melt rate could drive rapid change. We tend to try and avoid the use of the term doomsday glacier because it tends to suggest that there's nothing left for us to do. And that's definitely not the case. Every fraction of a degree matters, and scientists say curbing greenhouse gas emissions will still help avoid the worst effects. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal.
A week tonight, the war in Ukraine will hit a major milestone, one year since Russia's invasion. The fight, of course, rages on. Adrian and the national team are there to bring you special coverage. That is incoming Russian artillery on the front lines of the war in Ukraine. Days before the one-year anniversary of this war, the fight is intensifying and we have rare access to the most precarious battlefields. This is Bakhmut. This city is now surrounded on three sides by Russian forces. The fight, the people caught in it, and the future of a Ukraine that's desperately holding on. Now that they've fired, they have to go down into the bunker. The National from Ukraine, all next week. Lots more to come on this edition of The National, including growing concern about cases of a deadly virus related to Ebola in a small African country. A raging fire can be launching embers to other parts of the planet. The race to get ahead of the outbreak before it spreads further. Next. With the report into the government's use of the Emergencies Act now out, what's the political fallout? At issue, we'll be here for a special edition. Plus, how thieves are using fobs to steal cars. I think all the companies that are building these vehicles have a big responsibility to all of us consumers. Coming up, why some say it's up to car makers to fix the problem. We're back in two. Incredibly, Turkish rescuers are still finding people alive 12 days after devastating earthquakes shattered the region. This man spent 278 hours under the rubble in Hatay province. This woman in Karaman Maresh was buried almost that long, and it's not just people beating the odds. Rescuers are still finding pets frightened and bewildered, but alive. Meanwhile, aid continues to flow into both Turkey and Syria, desperately needed now as the confirmed number of dead passes 45,000. The WHO is sounding the alarm on a deadly outbreak in Equatorial Guinea. In the small West African nation, so far at least nine people are dead from the Marburg virus, which is related to Ebola. Thousands are quarantining and there are more suspected cases in Cameroon. Christine Birak tells us why health officials say we need to move fast. Es grave y mortal. It's a deadly illness health officials in Equatorial Guinea have never seen before, but others have, and they're worried. Marburg belongs to the same family of viruses as Ebola, and like Ebola, has a very high fatality ratio. Marburg virus lives in fruit bats. It transmits from person to person through bodily fluids and causes severe hemorrhagic fever, bleeding in organs throughout the body. The illness kills 50 to nearly 90 percent of people infected. Previous outbreaks in Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola led to hundreds of deaths. There are no approved treatments or vaccines. People travel, people can move. It can, it can turn into a much larger problem. Public health doctors worldwide are racing to send experts, medical supplies and protective gear. Equatorial Guinea is reporting a handful of deaths. Several cases are still being investigated there and in Cameroon. Thousands of people are now being quarantined inside their homes. This is where there are some suspected cases just right across the border. So, Dr. Cameron you know, Kahn tracks viruses around the globe. He says the case count is likely an underestimate, noting outbreaks are kind of like house fires. Every second counts. You don't want the fire department coming uh, two hours from now because your house may be engulfed in flames. Raising the risk for more outbreaks. A raging fire can be launching embers to other parts of the planet. Canadian scientist Gary Kobinger worked on a Marburg vaccine over a decade ago. We had indeed, uh, at that time, a good vaccine uh, candidate. The work was shelved due to funding. Experts insist countries should invest in public health and get ahead of virus threats. It can end up costing billions of dollars, and the, the price of development of those vaccines and therapeutics is in the millions. This COVID-19 pandemic revealed several gaps. Experts say if lessons in protecting public health aren't learned, the same mistakes will be repeated. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Here's Rosie with a special edition of At Issue.
Thanks, Anita. It's a busy day here in Ottawa, as you know. An inquiry into the federal government's invocation of the Emergencies Act found they met the threshold to do so. But can the federal government finally close this chapter on this controversial move? Plus, we'll tackle the leaked thesis documents that outline China's strategy to influence the last election. Althea, Andrew and Gary Mason are here right after this. After careful reflection, I have concluded that the very high threshold required for the invocation of the Act was met. Obviously, um, it took failures. It took systems that weren't able to solve a situation that ideally would have been able to solve by a robust uh, set of institutions and uh, principles like we have in Canada that we would need to invoke an Emergencies Act. This was an emergency that Justin Trudeau created by attacking his own population, by driving up their cost of living, by making it impossible for people to pay their bills and live their lives in peace. Just some of the comments here in Ottawa today after a busy day. The inquiry into the federal government's use of the Emergencies Act found, as you heard there, that the government met the high legal threshold to use it. What else does the report tell us about the government's use of the act and what political lessons are there? We've assembled a special Friday at issue, because why not? Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, and uh, in for Chantal Hébert, Gary Mason tonight. Good to see you all. Appreciate you doing this on a Friday. Uh, Andrew, I, I, were you surprised that uh, Justice Rouleau found that the government had, had met this legal threshold? Uh, not particularly. I, there's not a le great deal of surprise in the report to anybody who was paying attention. It mostly confirms what people who didn't have ideological access to grind uh, would have gleaned already from the evidence. But that's useful and important to have somebody uh, manifestly fair looking at this and coming to a very reasoned judgment on this about the, the, uh, the evidence in front of it. And just retelling the events is as important as anything else. Sure. But on the particular issue of uh, whether the government was, was justified, whether it met the threshold, you know, much, much too, attention, too much attention was paid to the question of whether the, the CSIS standard had been met, et cetera. What was really the important language in the act is, did the government have reasonable grounds to believe that there was a public right. emergency? Uh, and uh, the judge found uh, absolutely they did, that, that the, the, the notion that this was just a peaceful protest full of people face painting and dancing uh, just simply did not accord with the facts that there was riding, rising tide of, of aggressive rhetoric coming from people in there. There were bad actors in the middle there with who knows what kind of agendas. You had uh, copycat protests popping up all across the country. And so a government could reasonably look at this and say, uh, in the face of just a complete and total breakdown of the police, ability to deal with this, that something more had to be done. Right, that the security threat was real and that the context around all of this mattered too. Althea, was there, was there anything in there that y you could see as a, an important lesson for a government going forward or for this government in particular? Well, there were a lot of strong words for the Ontario government, uh, which shirked its responsibility with regards to Ottawa. Like it, the commissioner actually goes to great pains to point out that Ottawa is a municipality and that is a creature of the province and therefore the province has the jurisdiction over policing in Ottawa. Um, and that, the, you know, Doug Ford's government wouldn't go to the trilateral uh, talks and that um, if there had been more coordination earlier on, that perhaps we wouldn't have had the situation that required the federal government invoking the Emergencies Act. Um, but I was actually quite surprised to the extent to which Commissioner Rouleau went to agree with the government, mm -hmm. uh, not just on the expanded definition of whether or not uh, you need to abide by the CSIS definition of the act as per you know, CSIS's interpretation of it, um, but even on matters where you thought he might have been critical, like how the fact the government did not give the commissioner their legal opinion, yeah. he says, oh, well, I didn't really need it. <laughs> I can make my opinion without actually having it. Um, or that uh, one of his strongest criticisms is about the fact that there is no kind of way for you to get off the frozen bank account list yeah. after you've left Ottawa. And he's like, well, I'm convinced that if the protest had lasted longer and the measures had lasted longer, that the government would have gone and fixed this. So, you know, there 
are several points where he could have been a little bit more firm, uh, but he sides with the government. He agrees with the government on they shouldn't have spoken to the protesters. That was understandable. Mm -hmm. The meeting with the premier is, uh, yeah, he thinks that amounted to consultation. So many points of disagreement um, with different partners uh, involved in the commission, he sides with the government. So to me, the whole, yeah. like, taken together suggests that if you know, another government had not acted this way, well, then the government would have shirked its responsibilities. Like, yeah. he's so glowing in his praise. It, so, so does that mean it's a, it's a vindication in some ways, Gary, for, for the government and, and what they did here? I, uh, I don't know. If, I, I suppose it is. But I, I think that most fair-minded Canadians, uh, you know, totally sided with the government right from the beginning. I think there was probably a lot of Canadians were wondering why we were even having an inquiry into this, yeah. even though it's, it's, you know, it's, it's mandated under the law as soon as you use the Emergencies Act. I, I thought, to me, one of the most interesting things in the report was his view that federalism failed in this yeah. case, that, that in order for this country to work, that, that politicians, our political leaders, need to set aside their partisan interests for the common good, and that clearly did not happen here. I think Doug Ford clearly, uh, he, he didn't listen, he didn't want to get involved until the, the uh, Ambassador Bridge was shut down and, and the economy, his economy was really uh, mm -hmm. gonna get hit hard and the calls to his office started and that's when he responded. But until then, he didn't want to have anything to do with it because the federal conservatives were pandering to this group. They thought this, this was a group that was in their best interest to, to pander to. Uh, I think this, as Althea says, I mean, I think this is a real indictment of, of Doug Ford's leadership in a time of real crisis in this country. Andrew, do, do you agree with that? And, and, and do you think that this report now sort of um, mutes or blunts anything federal conservatives can say about the way the government acted? Yeah, I, I think you could tell that from the body language and, and the, the response in the Conservatives. This, they, they want this to go away pretty quickly. I don't think they, if, they, if it had been a much more critical report, they would have been riding it all the way to next election. But I don't think they want to talk about this much more anymore. I mean, I think what this report brings out is that the issue here was much less to do with whether or not the Emergencies Act should have been invoked, but how on earth did we get here and the many failures right. at all levels that, that led to that. Uh, I think he does a real service in just explaining to people what actually is, is in the Emergencies Act. A lot of the hysteria around this was based on the idea that this was something tantamount to martial law, mm -hmm. and it fundamentally isn't. It, it no. is, uh, you know, strictly time limited with about six layers of oversight and rather limited powers that it gives the government to, to what it can actually do. And we saw that in the use of it to basically, you know, commandeer a few trucks, uh, freeze some bank accounts for a couple of days. Uh, and and not much more than that. Uh, so so uh, I think understanding that this is not the War Measures Act. This was the bill that was brought in to replace the War Measures Act okay. and to learn the lessons of the War Measures Act. I think if anything's been vindicated, it's the Emergencies Act itself. Well, he even says, uh, Althea, and last word to you, that that it, that it's not dictatorial, contrary to way the way some people were trying to frame it as the government was using it. That's true. He does make um, two criticisms of the government. Uh, that I think are worth talking about. Um, he specifically points the finger at Justin Trudeau twice in the overview volume. I'll be honest, it's the only part, it's like almost 300 pages, only part I read today. <laughs> um, so maybe he points the finger elsewhere as well. But uh, he says that Justin Trudeau in calling the protesters a small fringe minority and also referencing another press conference where he talked about conspiracy theorists with tinfoil hats and focusing yeah. on the protesters who danced on the war memorial, who carry Confederate flags and Nazi flags, that he, um, he made the the problem worse, that he emboldened the protesters, uh, he made the protesters distress government, he, he probably made the thing last longer. And um, so I think that that's noteworthy. And obviously, the prime minister came out and for the first time acknowledged that he should have chosen his words more carefully. Yeah. And we know we've been asking him this for almost a year and a half, and this is the first time he came out. Uh, Pierre Poilievre, though, used those words to suggest that um, the government had caused the protest. Mm -hmm. The other point, briefly, I'll make is um, Marco Mendicino telling, the public safety minister telling committee and the House that he acted on the advice of law enforcement officials. Justice Rulo doesn't point the finger at Marco Mendicino, but one of his recommendation is that those law enforcement officials should put their opinion in writing. Yeah. Uh, Gary, I'll give you 20 seconds just and then I'll got to take a quick break. 
Yeah, no, I, 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 I think that, uh, you know, the criticism of Justin Trudeau for some of the language that he used was fair. However, I would say that most of the protests are certainly those that arrived from the West were uh, not fans of Justin Trudeau long before he uttered those words. In fact, I mean, this was an anti-Trudeau rally right. that was formed in thought and manner and planning long before he made those those comments. So, I mean, to, to blame this kind of on him or inflaming this situation is, is maybe a little bit much. I mean, maybe he could have used his language more conservatively, but, uh, you know, these, these people were anti-Trudeau people years ago. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more at issue. And we'll look at these reports in the Globe and Mail that China had a blueprint to influence the 2021 election. The documents suggest China wanted a liberal minority in the past election. What implication does that have to this government? That's next. He is perfectly happy to let a foreign authoritarian government interfere in our elections as long as they're helping him. And according to the Globe and Mail story today, this foreign authoritarian government wanted to see Justin Trudeau as prime minister because they knew that he would work for their interests rather than Canada's interest. Conservative leader Pierre Poiliev there responding to uh, the Globe and Mail story today. Uh, CSIS documents that outlined China's strategy to try and meddle in the last election. Documents that Globe and Mail reporters looked at. What implications could this have for the Liberals? At issue is back. Andrew, Althea and Gary. Uh, Andrew, you start us off on this one. Um, how troubling is this to you, these revelations? How, how damaging is this for the government? Uh, hugely troubling and potentially enormously damaging. I think much worse in its implications than the Emergencies Act. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's bad enough that the Chinese were not just interfering in our elections, and it appears in two straight elections, uh, but they weren't doing it randomly. They were doing it with the particular purpose of electing liberals and preventing conservatives from being elected. Uh, now, you know, presumably the only reason they did that was for reasons that the, 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 the public positions the government has taken and for which they can be held to account. But the evidence is that they that that the security people were preparing documents and briefing the government and or the prime minister uh, going back not just to the previous to this last election, but going back some years. There's been some stories going back as far as 2017. So if they knew about this and that remains to be seen how much they knew, but it'd be hard, be hard to believe they didn't know something as important as this. If they knew about this, what, if anything, did they do about it? And certainly they don't seem to have told anybody. They just simply sat on this information, yeah. didn't tell the public, didn't tell the candidates who were the targets of the conservative, of, of, the, of the disinformation campaigns. So to just sort of sit there and accept the help, if you will, I mean, Pierre Paul ever put it a little too strongly, but not a whole lot. It, it's really troubling in its implications. Althea? The government needs to be more transparent about what it knows, what it knew, when it knew it, and why it didn't tell anybody. Um, you know, to kind of harken back to the previous topic, when you're talking about conspiracy theorists, there are a lot on the internet. And if the government doesn't want people to believe that the election was stolen, they need to be more transparent. And the answer that the prime minister gave today um, did not actually offer any answers. Um, you know, prior to the last election, or. Of 2019, the government created this panel of like deputy ministers and experts who were supposed to warn us if there was anything like this. And they didn't say anything in 2019 and they didn't say anything in 2021. Um, so why not? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And is is there a failure? Like has this information, did this information not reach them or did they not do their jobs or were they too afraid to do their job? Like there's a lot of questions. Or did and they not in, deem it worthy of, of, of flagging? I mean, because we don't really know. We don't know that part either. We don't know. Yeah. And that, and part of the Globe Mail's reporting also suggests that there's like a kickback scheme. I mean, that's election fraud. So why is there no follow up from like other election agencies like Elections Canada or the RCMP? Right. Um, so there's a lot of questions and the longer they go unanswered the more it's going to fuel people who think that the last election was unfair. Maybe the, I, last, the one I, I before that too. I will just say, because we didn't play the clip, though, that the Prime Minister again today said that uh, he has been told that it did not affect the outcome yeah. of the election in 2019 or 2021. It doesn't give answers to that. No, we only have yes. his word, right? And right. I think that's why they need to be more transparent. Gary. Yeah, I'm, I, I, was, I was really puzzled by the Prime Minister's comments to 
today about that, Rosie. I mean, he was he sort of sort of blithely dismissed the whole thing and mm -hmm. you know suggested that he's known for years. It's been out there for years. You know that there's foreign countries trying to meddle in our elections and but you know there's not it's not something that we need to worry about and that it didn't affect the outcome of of any of the races well i just don't know how he knows that and how how can he say that how can he how does he know that that some of this disinformation that was spread out there about certain conservative candidates didn't have a a a, a an impact on the mm -hmm. on the base result of a particular race i don't think there's any way that he can say that with any kind of authority. I, I, I think that this is a very serious issue, as Andrew says, and I, I think it, it, it's going to, it warrants much, much more serious and a deeper investigation than what the Prime Minister uh, indicated today that he's prepared to do with this. I think this is a really big deal in this country, and it's like one of the biggest stories to come along in a long time, and it mm -hmm. needs to be taken yeah. much more seriously than it appears to be taken right now. Just quickly, Andrew, yeah. And a, a serious and an independent investigation. It is not going to be enough for Liberals to investigate Liberals on something like this. Or for it to be done at a parliamentary committee, which is where it is now as well. Okay, uh, I'll leave yeah. it there. Thank you all for being here on a Friday. Althea, Andrew, thanks for coming back. Gary, a pleasure to welcome you here as well. Now I'll send things back to Anita in Vancouver. Thanks, Rosie. Car thefts are on the rise across the country and thieves are using fobs to get the job done. Cars are being stolen left, right, and center in every big city in Canada. Up next, why some are calling on automakers to do more. Plus, the hardworking toddler that is melting hearts on TikTok in our moment. A big city mayor is pushing a new plan to deal with a wave of vehicle thefts. It includes asking automakers to take more responsibility. Philip Lee Shanuk shows us what that would entail and whether the idea is gaining traction. At the Canadian International Auto Show in Toronto, car theft is on the minds of many. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially in our neighbourhood, there's a lot, been a lot of thefts lately, so it is, it is something we're uh, prioritising when we purchase a vehicle. One of the more basic features that many find convenient is becoming part of the problem. For years, auto manufacturers have asked you to put your faith in one of these. It's your key fob that activates your engine immobilizer. And now that thieves have defeated that technology, manufacturers haven't come up with anything new. It's called relay theft. The thief uses a device to boost the signal from your fob and start your car. 32 cars have been stolen this way every day in Toronto, a big jump from last year. Car theft is an acute problem in nearby Peel region. 6,000 thefts last year. That's double what it was two years ago. Insurance rates there are among the highest in the country. The mayor of Brampton wants automakers to take responsibility. Cars are being stolen left, right and centre in every big city in Canada. Um, and it's, it, it crushes a family's sense of safety. He wants automakers of the most targeted vehicles to issue recalls and find a way to block these thefts from happening. If they won't do it on their own, he's calling on Ottawa to force them, just as it mandated those engine immobilizers. I think all the companies that are building these vehicles have a big responsibility to all of us consumers. The Ministry of Public Safety says the government is doing something by working with local police and targeting organized crime to stop the thefts. But right now, there are no plans to make automakers do anything. Philip Shadok, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, this guy needs an employee of the month plaque. Little Thomas is only 15 months old, but the helpful baby has been getting things done in the cutest way possible at his family's business in Quesnel, BC. Now, his mom caught his work ethic on camera, posting it to TikTok, and the video has already racked up more than 34 million views. The hardest working toddler you've ever seen is our moment. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. He just waits for the truck to come and he's ready to go. We drop all the kids off at school and then we head up to the water shop for nine o'clock. And then we just kind of load and unload the trucks throughout the day. And he's just taken. <laughs> he's just taken to it. <laughs> he started walking in about 10 and a half months. He gets a second wind when we load the van and he's just doing his thing and it's pretty awesome. I'm the boss, boss, baby, boss, 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 baby, boss, boss. It's just taken off. It's, it's overwhelming. 
I can't thank everyone enough. The kind comments is just, it's pretty awesome. I like the moment, moment. He really does enjoy it and we don't set him up to do it. He's like living his best life. It's just one of those make you feel good, happy stories. Yeah, it does make you happy. And you know, toddlers like to be helpful as a mom of one uh, with a lot of things to clean around the house. I have no problem with that. I'm all for it. That's the National for February 17th. Thanks for being with us and have a good night.